you need to make sure that you're not publicly disclosing anything uh, that is uh, considered IP before you uh, you file. Otherwise, it'll it'll act against you as a public record or public knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, before uh, before submitting my master thesis, I filed this provisional patent application with the with the United States Patent Office. Welcome back to the Clean Techies podcast, where we interview climate tech founders and VCs to discuss all things building and investing to solve the biggest challenge of our generation, climate change. Today, we are joined by Anas al Qasas, the founder and CEO of Interviews, where they are helping solve heat loss for buildings. Their technology is essentially a retrofit solution to single pane glass that can be achieved at scale. They are also partnering with other companies such as solar glass and tinting services to act as a platform for them to sell their technologies. The key things in this conversation that we discussed today are how their technology works, how he got started in the process of going through accelerators for them to get their initial round of funding. He also talked about the process of getting the IP licensed, how that worked and his experience and advice there, and how they are using a creative financing models to remove the friction from buying for their buyers. Enjoy the episode. All right. Welcome to the show, Adas. How are you doing today? Thank you. Thank you, Silas. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really excited to have you on. I think this is some pretty interesting technology. So before we get into that, let's just go uh, into the the beginning, a little bit of about who you are and how did you get into this space? Sure. Uh, so my name is uh, Anas Alcasas. I'm the founder and CEO of Innoviews uh, and the inventor behind the technology. Um, I'm, my background is in architecture and facade engineering. Uh, I'm originally from Syria. I, I did my bachelor's degree in architecture in, in Damascus University and then Graduated, worked for a um, uh, kind of regional facade fabricator instead of the traditional um, architectural office, and then went to Dubai, worked there for about four years uh, with some of the best names kind of in the industry uh, in architecture and, and uh, facade contracting, manufacturing, testing. Uh, so I got this multidisciplinary experience in architecture, facade engineering, and um, from there, I uh, moved to Boston, did my master's degree in architecture at the Boston Architectural College, and um, uh, worked for some interesting names in, in the architectural world, like uh, Moshe Safdi Architects and Elkis Manfredi Architects on projects all over the, all over the world. Uh, and within that period, I kind of started uh, working on interviews as an idea uh, for the first year, and then moved to Houston. Uh, Founded the company in 2017, and uh, here we are. Very good. So I'm kind of keen to get into this. So how how I guess did you come up with the idea? Idea because it, you you also mentioned at the beginning that you came up with the technology, so you invented it. So how does somebody go from being an architect to kind of tinkering with something and, be, and developing a new technology? You know, people might be familiar with in the tech space. Uh, if people have an idea, they can just go like you know, play around with a website or something or build something. Right? It's non. It's not very technical. But this seems like something that's in, in, in kind of a, an invention. So could you talk about that process of how you came into this? Like, what, what does it look like to tinker with that kind of thing? And then how did you end up getting the idea? Yeah, sure. I mean, given my background in architecture, so architects are really great at uh, being creative with problem solving. Um, so a lot of times, you know, you're, you're facing uh, in any project you're doing from the beginning, while it's on paper, you're, you're facing a number of challenges uh, that you're trying to resolve and come up with unique ideas and ways to do that. And uh, in this case, I was intentionally looking for uh, for ideas that I can address and tackle from this multidisciplinary kind of point of view where I have the technical knowledge about facade engineering, given that I work in this space, developing, building, testing, manufacturing these systems. And at the same time, being an architect, having this po wide point of view about how, you know, buildings constru are constructed and designed and developed. So at one point I was looking for, you know, uh, ideas where I can make a larger impact than just a, a, a one-off project or one-off prototype. And then you repeat the cycle again. I wanted to do something where it can be scalable. And it's a problem that has a wide impact uh, nationally and internationally. So, um, Windows is is something that I've I've known for uh, and facades really have been interested in, especially especially kind of dynamic and advanced adaptive systems. My first serious attempt was actually 
my bachelor's degree project uh, and it won an international award. And uh, that got me into the facade engineering world. And so that's kind of uh, the first uh, system. And it was a retrofit system, uh, complete chance. And um, it was able to adapt to 108 conditions to filter air, light, and and kind of uh, all of uh, you know the, the heat, cold and uh, hot and cold, without having to really uh, you know change anything. So it's it's like an adaptive system to whatever the condition is. Um, so I was looking, I was sitting in my apartment looking at the windows, and I started thinking, how, is there a way we can maybe transform these facades and windows to becoming smart, energy efficient, without replacing anything? So that was kind of the start of the idea, start looking, you know, in the market, see if there's anything similar. And that's when I learned about the big energy efficiency problem with existing buildings and that facades and windows are attributing about up to 40% uh, of that problem. Um, you know, as architects, uh, most of the, most of the focus we have is on new construction. So you're, you're looking to build new buildings, but, existing buildings uh, represent, you know, like 98% of the built environment. Um, and uh, at the time, you know, 10 years ago, or when, you know, you're in architecture school, little focus was given to existing buildings, efficiency and, and performance and, and kind of uh, challenges and problems in the real world. Hey there, quick break to remind any founders or VCs listening, if you are looking for deal flow, seeking to raise funding, looking for partners to help service your needs, or perhaps you're looking for corporate investment partners, feel free to reach out to us through our Slack channel, which can be found in the description. Because we meet a lot of people in this space, we set aside time each week to make introductions to the various people that we encounter. This is something we do free of charge in order to help these incredible companies solving climate change to scale. Looking forward to hearing from you in the Slack channel. Interesting. So how, how exactly... What kind of resources does it require to play around with this? Are you able to kind of test out designs and some type of software to figure out, okay, how can we just take a piece of glass and infuse technology into it? Maybe it would be helpful if you you give us an idea of what was already there and you knew like what infrastructure was there to innovate within glass. And then how in the world do you get glass to have technology inside of it? So one of the important things is that our technology is not around the glass itself. Uh, so the technology is glass agnostic um, and adaptive to mostly any type of glass. The idea is how can you integrate a new layer, a new piece of glass that has, uh, you know, high performance, all the latest technologies into existing building facades without having to remove or replace the existing windows or glass systems or uh, have a very invasive process or and costly process of doing so. So the, the technology is more around the system that enables that. And the idea, when, when, you know, as an architect, you can sketch and start to develop the, the, the entire uh, solution from, you know, basic sketches and, rap, and then rapid prototyping, you know, using 3D printing. And I was, uh, uh, I was able to use some of the resources that are at the Boston Architectural College when I was doing my master's degree, because it was around that topic. And the, the master thesis ended up becoming the early research report or book for for this technology so first year was just purely design thinking trying to see what is currently available in terms of materials and components and how other technologies like insulating glass technology work and then how would you take that reconstruct it in a different way where it enables the what i'm trying to to achieve so you're you're looking at the kind of state of the art currently uh, in different different aspects and then you're taking components and you're trying to reiterate and reiterate until kind of you're solving all the challenges so on for the first year it was pure system development and you know th there was no actual testing of the technology it was just design thinking to be able to see can this be done uh, you were pushing the boundaries on many fronts when it comes to facade engineering and, and system and, and facade systems and glazing systems but uh, the concept was very, very challenging at the beginning. So from there, you know, after the first year, the system got to a point where it can be prototyped. And that was when I, you know, went through the Cleantech Open Accelerator 
to see, okay, how can we, because it's beyond now my capabilities to produce or fabricate such a system and, and go, uh, you know, put it through industry tests and, and see if it actually works. Um, so I went through the accelerator and went through the Central Texas Angel Network uh, kind of uh, fundraising process. And uh, fortunately, ended up winning the national award uh, for the Clean Tech Open, which came in with a $50,000 check, non-dilutive funding, and at the same time, got the kind of first angel investor from the uh, from CTAM. Uh, so that money enabled me to fabricate and per, you know the first prototype and put it through testing. Up until that moment, there was no no guarantee that this technology is going to work. And after you know a year, year and a half of work and development and, and design and iterations, you put it through the testing in the real world, no matter how, how many simulations you've done and all the kind of interesting software uh, applications you can use with the uh, FEA analysis and uh, CFD and all of that, still, you know, the real world uh, kind of simulation of testing is different. Um, so... First couple of years was really challenging mm -hmm. in terms of technology development. Mm -hmm. So for those unfamiliar, I, I would like to ask two questions. So one is what are the components that you're trying to solve? You mentioned temperature, you mentioned air quality. There's some things that you're trying to solve for. What are let's first go there? What are those components that you had already been looking at to try to solve specifically for people unfamiliar with this design process? Yeah, sure. So the primary use case for what we're doing is transforming single pane windows to double pane windows. And if, I don't know if and you know, you're know you familiar with this, but a lot of windows have a, a single layer of glass. Uh, and this is very energy inefficient because glass as a material is great. You can see through it, but in terms of heat transfer, it's one of the worst materials. So, you know, uh, you can lose a lot of heat when you have big difference in temperature between inside and outside. So if it's cold inside, you know, cold outside and you need to stay at around 70 degrees inside, then a lot of the energy being um, put into the space to keep it at a, at a comfortable level is going out the window, literally. So uh, tra putting transforming the single pane to double pane. So double pane windows, it's an invention, you know, came in uh, in the mid uh, uh, last century. It's two panes of glass with an air gap in between. So you're kind of creating a sandwich out of it. Uh, and that became, you know, kind of the standard in around the 80s, uh, 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 kind of uh, 1980s, 1985. Uh, but if you look at the current building stock, there's about 40% of all buildings still have single pane windows. And you need to replace them. And that's the problem. You can't, you know, replacing them is very, very disruptive to the operations of the building. You need to vacate the perimeter spaces. Uh, and it's a very costly and long process. And you're throwing away an existing pane of glass that otherwise can, can live a thousand years as a material. Hey there, are you building a climate tech business and looking for very specialized talent? Consider reaching out to our sponsors, Next Wave Partners. Next Wave are experts in talent acquisition, recruitment, and retention across the climate tech, renewables, and ESG spaces globally. So if your team is growing or you're looking to make a career change yourself, feel free to reach out to Next Wave at next-wavepartners.com or reach out to one of their consultants directly via their LinkedIn page. So the solution here is to try to build and utilize and upcycle what's currently existing instead of throwing it away and add on top of it and create that sandwich out of in place, basically, out of the existing glass. This sandwich is typically this IGU insulating glass unit is built in a factory. So now you're replicating that on site and you want to replicate it in a way that is scalable. So you're not doing this for one window, you're doing it over like a full building, maybe a high rise. So they, that's where the challenges come in. And uh, you have all buildings have different shapes, different sizes, different you know characteristics. So you're trying to create a system that is scalable and adaptable and can work with all kinds of window systems and glazing systems and be able to perform well like factory-made uh, insulating glass units, you know, something mm -hmm. that's kind of the unique aspect of it. Got it. So the the big issue of what you're trying to solve is really the energy efficiency, right? Because of the, the heat loss, because the air, the air gap acts as essentially an insulation barrier to prevent more heat loss. Um, yeah. I remember learning about that when I was young. We were building... Um, I was homeschooled growing up and my 
dad was a builder. We built a new house when I was like eight, nine years old. Uh, cool. And I remember learning about the the specific things around insulation because he's big on insulating our house so that we could heat it with a, a minimal amount of, of effort. But exactly. um, so, okay, so that's helpful. And then if we were to explain the technology to, you know, your grandma, somebody who, who who's maybe somebody who is very non-technical, you're, if I want to make sure, that maybe I've got this right, but I'd like you to, to, you know, take a crack at it after I very badly take a stab is um, you're taking existing glass from most likely single pane glass from, from buildings. And you have, you're adding another piece of glass that's essentially acting as that second pane to create better insulation. And there's some other technologies involved as well that are there. Is that correct? Yeah. You're adding another layer of glass with a separation between creating sort of a thermos out of the, you know, existing window. And that makes it more insulated. So lose little, little energy compared to the, the existing situation, it makes the space more comfortable. So you can sit near the window, work, sleep, you know, it makes it um, uh, much better in terms of the overall carbon footprint of the building, you know, energy emission, uh, you know, carbon emissions of the building too. And there's a number of technologies. Now, when you're when you're opening the world to adding another piece of glass and you're looking at tech glass technology over the past decade or so, there's been a num you know, huge advancement in that area. So there are now advanced glass technologies, smart glass technologies. You can have transparent photovoltaic, you know, window, solar windows that you can see through uh, that you can put on these high rise buildings. And then you can turn building facades into micro power grids. You have dynamic tinting where, you know, you can change the tint of the window with a you know, a switch or a button on your phone and uh, control privacy, control solar heat gain. Uh, you have uh, bird-friendly glass now. There are regulations in New York that mandating uh, bird-friendly glass on all high-rises. Uh, there's a number of new technologies that are only now available for high -rise, new construction. And now you can integrate these technologies into existing buildings in a cost-effective and non-disruptive way. So you're taking your technology and then overlaying other technologies such as the tinting or uh, yeah. the solar technologies into this additional pane of glass. Is that correct? Exactly. So we've created more of like you, you want to think about it as a platform for these new glass products and solutions and technologies to be available or integrated into existing buildings. Interesting. Okay. So yeah. are you able to speak to us a little bit about the technology behind the you know these like dynamic tinting uh, mechanisms like can you speak to that and how how it works just at a very base level for us to understand sure so uh it's called you know for dynamic tinting there's a number of technologies the the simplest one if you want to think about it the transitional lenses you know you go out and you know it becomes dark and then you go inside if it's dark it becomes you know or uh bright um, you know the opposite so that's uh photochromic um, now there is thermochromic. So thermochromic, for example, if the glass is hot, it gets darker. So you put it on a building and the sun hits the glass. That means mm. you know, it's heating it up and then it becomes darker to reduce the amount of, you know, heat gain that is going, going through the window. The most advanced, the more advanced, uh, uh, asp or, you know, kind of, uh, kind or option of this technology is electrochromic. So electrochromic, you, you have kind of a sandwich, two layers of glass, and then uh, a stack inside, basically an electrode uh, and cathode, and then you run electricity in it, and then it turns the turns that kind of layer of sandwich into a tinted uh, glass. And you can control the level of tint. So you want it, you know, 100% opaque, for example, for privacy, or you want it 25%. You can even connect it to sensors now on the building and have the the all the windows and facades be kind of connected to the building management system and tracks the weather conditions uh in real time so you have you know expectations that it's going to be cloudy here so you need to probably make it clearer and then on the south facade it's really hot so you tint that area or in other air in other cases you have a you know a nearby building and uh, the tenant or the occupant wants to you know maintain privacy at a certain time so they can control it with their phone there's an app so there's a number of applications you can you can utilize and this is just one technology now there is you know uh self-powered electrochromic that is being developed now where 
you don't need the wires and the electricity. It's, you know, it harvests the energy from the sun and then it activates the electrochromic. Uh, so there's a number of new exciting developments happening in the space. Mm -hmm. Interesting. With at the at the risk of sounding very very uh dumb, how how exactly can they use electricity? Is there another layer or some type of film that goes on top of the glass for them to use to change that tint, or is it something that's like in the chemical makeup of the glass? It's it's a film or a coating that is applied. So you have like a number of layers of very very thin coatings, kind of uh, uh, nanomaterials applied on the surface of the mm -hmm. glass, treated, and, and these layers. It's creating a stack and having this uh, electrode and cathode, and you know, and mm. you're in the edge of the. You have bus, bus bars at the edge of the glass, and then that's connected to, um, you know, wires, and the wires are connected to, uh, mm -hmm. network, and then you can kind of control the. You need just five volts to activate and turn it from one state to another, something around that, and uh, that's not my our areas of specialty. Yeah. You know, working with these companies that are developing these technologies, we've we've come to learn all about these. Uh, exciting um, systems. Hey there. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you made it this far, it's likely that you're enjoying the show. So I wanted to ask your help. If you're enjoying it, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts and share with somebody in the same industry who might find this interesting. And if you're interested in getting summaries of these episodes, go subscribe to our newsletter that comes out on LinkedIn and Substack. Links can be found in the description. Thanks for your help in growing the reach of this show. Yeah, that's quite interesting though. I mean, e either way, I think the the really fascinating part here is that you are trying to create a platform technology that's physical, right? Like a physical platform yeah. and the method to be able to apply these uh, additional panes of glass to other buildings. So maybe really briefly, could we talk about how you do that, especially when you mentioned, of course, that, you know, you look at the, even your background, you've got all these different size pieces of glass and, I remember working for my dad in his cabinet shop growing up, we'd always, when we were, you know, putting glass into some like cabinet doors or whatnot, we'd have to go call the hardware store and get the measurements. And like, how do you do this on scale? Yes. So the first thing we, we wanted to make sure uh, uh, we, we nailed that right is the adaptability of the system. So there are a number of uh, tolerance gaps and, and, and tolerances incorporated into the development and design where you don't need the existing windows to be measured 100% accurately and uh, like to a millimeter, for example, or to, you know, one sixteenth of an inch. Um, you don't need the the windows to be 100% square because obviously you're dealing with, win you know, windows that are like 10, 20, 30 years old. So there is a lot of uh, irregularities there. So that's one of the things we've, you know, made sure that design from the get-go has that kind of capability and ability to adapt. Uh, what we do basically is we go to, we, we, you know, once we get a project, we, you know, our, our people walk the building and kind of do a building, quick building survey, basically looking at the windows, they take measurements of a few uh, window sizes, or, you know, a few windows of each typical size. So when you're looking at a building, not every window has a unique size. You, you have maybe three or, or a few, and if you measure, you know, five of each typical size, we have then formulas in house where we can uh, build on top of that and have a kind of a, an adaptable size that would work with everything else without having to go and measure everyone. So that's one of the aspects of how this could be scalable. Uh, from there, you know, uh, we've developed uh, our own kind of uh, installation tools that help guide this system when it's on site. So people that are trying to install it, they don't need any sort of heavy equipment or, or specialized uh, ex, you know, tools or any sort of um, very deep in-depth experience about something to be able to install it. So it's like, you want to think about it like an IKEA kit of parts. Uh, shipped to site, already prefabricated. The majority of the system is already prefabricated in-house. And then you're you're attaching a what's called like a spacer frame directly on the glass using structural glazing materials that are already pre-applied. So you're peeling a tape, applying a primer, and then you put these using the guiding tools that we have. And then within um, you know the next few hours, it can receive uh, the, the kind of new layer of glass with all of the other components, what we call it a unitized glazing panel. Um, and it's locked into position using a very special kind of three axis movement. So there are no fasteners because we're not drilling through anything. 
and then we put a perimeter of vapor seal around the 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 unit, um, and then it's done. You know, mm -hmm. you uh, you have an insulating uh, glass retrofit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, very cool. Um, all right. Are there specific limitations currently with the technology around execution on how big these buildings can be, the height and everything like that? Any any specific uh, limitations? Like, does it have to be an inset window versus uh, kind of flush to the surface? Anything like that? Well, so mainly weight is the uh, primary element that we look for that could become a limitation. And it depends on the size of the window, the building, the building size and location, um, and a number of things that we do on, on the back end. We also have uh, formulas that look looks at the uh, wind load, the dead load, and the, all of the other aspects of the window of the curtain wall system or the window system. Um, so, for example certain areas or certain buildings, we cannot use a six millimeter glass like core and so we go for, to five millimeter. Uh, in other areas where you need a very, you have very high wind load requirements. So we need to sometimes customize the system for it, if at all. So right now our system is adaptable to 98% of uh, buildings in the US. But for example, if you get a building on the coast of Florida where they require like 170 miles per hour or expect 170 mile per hour wind gusts, then we'll need, and, and you have like a high rise building where the windows are really large, like five by 10, then part of our system needs to be customized for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I wouldn't say there are limitations. It's the standardization that we currently have is adaptable to 98%. Mm -hmm. So if you project within the one or two percent then you need to customize a few things to be able to execute that mm -hmm. yeah okay interesting and let's go a little bit more into the the business building aspect so you you talked about getting um a non-dilutive grant to, to begin your work can you just walk us through the process at, at the beginning there of in particular how you decided and when you decided okay now i'm going to go do this full time i'm going to go put all my time and effort into building this technology what was the timeline? And then let's just go through those stages of the funding. Yeah. So um, it started with like for the first first year, it was it was a part time gig. Um, it, you know, I was I was doing my master's degree um, full time in Boston. And at the same time, I was working full time. So I only had time, you know, during the weekend, basically to to really work on this. And it didn't didn't make sense to quit work and quit everything and just focus on it in the for, for the first year because you know it's still it's still an idea you, you, there's a lot of uncertainties around it so after that first year it got to a point where the system conceptually and the technology conceptually is feasible and that's where i thought i wanted to really devote all my time and it's worth it so uh what i did basically is uh, I told my uh, my school that basically that's the topic I want to devote all my time for the master thesis for it. It's a, it's a bit too technical for a, a, a typical architectural master thesis, uh, but the school was very supportive. They said, you know, uh, whatever you want to do, we're, we're supportive. Um, so I quit my job and moved to Houston. So we have family in Houston um, and we moved in with them for like a year to be to afford working on this for another year full time. Uh, basically, while you're not making any 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 income, uh, so we cut expenses to almost nothing. And for that other year, that's where I made a lot of developments um, to get the system to be ready for fabrication. Uh, from that point, that's where I started, you know, um, kind of going through the Clean Tech Open Accelerator because I don't. I'm a first time founder. I don't have real experience in kind of building companies and taking them from, you know, a startup to an IPO or anything or an exit. So I wanted to go through an accelerator. Plus I'm a foreigner, you know, coming to the country, no connections, uh, potentially language barrier and, and things like that. So it was very hard to do everything on my own. So the accelerator was very, very critical and kind of advancing and, and giving some, uh, credibility that is much needed at the, at the beginning, uh, where the founder or the team are unknown basically in, in, in this world. So, um, that's kind of the point where, you know, I quit my job and come, came here and, and started working on it. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you got that initial, once you went through the accelerator program, um, 
make sure I got this right. You went through the accelerator and there was a $50,000 grant. You're able to kind of go and then build the, the prototype. Then what, then what happened? How, how did you go from there? Did you, were you able to prove something out and then get more funding? How, how did that work? Yeah. So at the same time, so the, the accelerator program was about like six months type program. It's like a mini MBA, but it's like a, a real life MBA. So you work on an actual idea, actual potential business. Um, and one of the interesting things is that they, they build a mentor team uh, that is well suited for you or appropriate for you uh, for the current stage. And uh, these are folks that are you know, either ex-CEOs that have done this before can guide you or uh, investors or, you know, executives that have been through and, you know, done, uh, I've seen companies grow and, and see how that is um, uh, typically done in, in other areas. And one of the mentor team members was um, the board member for the Central Texas Engine Network. Uh, and so after six months of seeing how, you know, uh, of going through the program and the learnings and everything, uh, so we built a, a really nice relationship. And he said, you should go through the, the C10 process. So we went, I went through it kind of simul- simultaneously. And that's where uh, actually his, he, he wrote the first check. So he put the first 50,000. And then within a week, we got the award announcement and we got the second fifty. And then other investors came in when we saw that and we got, we raised the first 250 K. So that's 250 K was then used to uh, partner with the glazing, you know, basically we, we've partnered with a glazing fabricator and, and, and a facade manufacturer here in, in, uh, in Dallas. And um, we start working on fabricating the first version of the system uh, and the, the first prototypes. And then we took that and we went to Intertech, which is uh, one of the, leading independent testing facilities here and put the first prototype through tests. After that, so when, when the technology passed these tests, the investors doubled down on their investments. So there was like that component that uh, you pass the test, we doubled down on the on the, on the investment uh, because it's like a major milestone. Um, from, that, from that point, the next target was to do a pilot to install the system on an actual building. And, that alone is, is is a very very big challenge because you're going to a building owner and say, "Hey, I want to try this new technology on your building for the first time. We haven't done anything like that before." Um, so finding the first early adopter uh, was a key component. That also happened through another accelerator program, and that was in Boston, the Greentown Labs. So Greentown Labs uh, put out a, a, a competition, ended up being selected and, and, and winning. And, uh, we, it's interesting. They connect you with a strategic partner and that strategic partner ended up being, uh, Saint-Gobain, which is a, uh, one of the world's leading glass manufacturers and building product materials. So we went through the, the, the process and identified a pilot. And then we installed our system for the first time on their North America research center in, in, uh, greater Boston area. Uh, and that got us the first customer because the first customer was waiting to see the images and photos of the first installation to feel comfortable about it. And they said, you know, I told them, give me one or two weeks and I'll send you images. And that was when, you know, we were executing the first installation. And then they saw it, they liked what they saw and they said, okay, we're willing to do a pilot with you. So we did a pilot and that was in Seattle. The pilot worked really well, and within a few days, they decided to go out and, and upgrade all the single pane windows in that that building in Seattle. So that was really our first actual customer, first actual project. And then, you know, from one to another, so you can kind of see the milestones there. Yeah, that's I mean, that's really fascinating. So I maybe just want to kind of walk back, walk that back and highlight a few of those things if I got this right, which is that you had this idea, you didn't have actually the technology built yet to prove it but you had some people who were very interested in the space and saw the potential one person wrote a check and then then you got an award which then kind of snowballed and you were able to raise 250 and then you ended up going into a an accelerator program which allowed you to find a strategic partner who would kind of take a shot on you right these people are forward thinkers people who are interested in interested in trying out new things without having to be coerced essentially yeah. And then from there, once you had that proven and saw that, hey, this is how it actually looks, it's something tangible, then a real customer was able to was able to buy or was exactly. interested in buying. Yeah. So one thing I want to clarify is um, 
with that strategic partner, was this a, a situation where they actually also invested or they just said, hey, you know, you can use our, our building as a test site? Like, how, how does that work? So they invested, actually. So we, we were uh, after that. So we raised another we raised like 500,000 uh, uh, that they put in. So they invested twice so far in, uh, in the company and uh, they now have a, a board kind of a board observer seat on uh, on the board of directors. Uh, so it ended up being really a great, great partnership and, and relationship with them. And the idea is because uh, you, you said it right. You, you're looking for an early adopter who is forward thinker and willing to take risk. And a lot of times, you know, the very first one needs to have some sort of technical capabilities to to understand the potent, like what's the what's the extent of the risk here. So. This was not a traditional commercial building owner. It was like a, you know, a research center. You have all of the very smart people uh, there in North America that are actually developing technologies and systems and glass is one of their specialty. So it was much easier for them to understand the technology and uh, kind of understand the potential risk in it and, and take, take a, 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 you know, a leap of faith on us. And throughout that, uh, for example, they helped us, uh, their uh, director of R&D, they helped us uh, go through an FMEA and out like failure mode and effects analysis study on the installation to full proof that. So we kind of, that was very helpful. Um, and then they also invested in the company uh, because they have a venture arm. Um, and uh, if you look at it, it was a very, very, you know, critical and, and helpful point in the time in the history line of of this company interviews so uh you got funding you got a pilot first cust first pilot customer and they covered the cost of the pilot too and uh it was uh you know they helped you improve the the technology too so you know that's what what more than that can a founder hope for so it, it was a very very helpful relationship yeah, I mean, it seems quite interesting. It's really, it's really uh, encouraging to see the, I guess, the ecosystem is working and and making things work because obviously it's it, it is difficult. Uh, if you have different mentality people, right? You mentioned it's an R and D lab. These people are trying to think about big problems. They may may be in many cases less kind of commercially focused, whereas a a building owner operator is going to see, hey, if I do this, this is going to be an expense, but I need to prove, like, I I got to have complete proof that it's actually going to benefit um the energy efficiency targets or whatnot so you need to have that that proof it's just interesting maybe something worth noting to the audience is if you're doing a technology like this it seems as though the secret to it is finding the person or organization that has a perfect alignment and there's most likely somebody out there right um Absolutely. one thing i'm curious about is the ip process so i'm sure there's some types of things here that are ip uh, you have your own intellectual property that you need to protect. What have you learned through this a process about making sure you get patents in place and everything? I've never really asked this question to, to guests. So I'd be keen to know a little bit about that process, what you learned from that and what you would have done differently. Yeah, I mean, that was a very uh, important point uh, throughout, you know, from, from the early days. And uh, I can't stress this enough how, you know, uh, for founders, because at the beginning you don't you're, you're a lot of times you're bootstrapping and uh uh this world of intellectual property and and patents is like a, a black box so um and it's very expensive it could be very very expensive um to get a patent go through that route and it takes a long time um so one of the first things that i tried to do like for that first year when i was like uh, here in houston working on the master thesis is to learn about patent law in my free time, if there is any free time. So for the first year, it was just, you know, reading a lot about, you know, the patent application process, how patents work, how patents are written, uh, you know, and what's actually patented, you know, the claims and the description and the prior art and all of these kind of things. So that at least when I'm talking to a patent attorney, I know what I'm talking about. And then you're able to select a really good patent attorney and then, at the beginning, you need to be, you're not going to be able to have a patent, you know, an IP uh, attorney or a team of attorneys draft that for you. Uh, it, this could run, you know, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, most likely you're going to be the founder or the, the CTO or the technical person 
who needs to draft the majority of the technology uh, of the specs uh, of specifications. So uh, that's how you know I went about this. So we learned a lot. Found found a good patent attorney that specialized in this space, and uh, ended up working with him to be able to put together the first uh, what they called provisional patent application. This gives you once you find you know you need to make sure that you're not publicly disclosing anything uh, that is uh, considered IP before you uh, you file. Otherwise, it'll it'll act against you as a public record or public knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, before uh, before submitting my master thesis, I filed this provisional patent application with the with the United States Patent Office. Um, and that gives you an early date. So it gives you what's called the priority date. And that date, from that date, you have a year. And within that year, you can then file a full-blown patent application. Could be, you know, like 20, 40, 60 pages uh, with all kinds of details and manufacturability and all of that. And because, you know, at the beginning, when you're developing the technology, you might not know 100% about uh, how this thing going to be built, but you want to get some protection of the aspects that have been developed so far. So a lot of time you file a provisional and then you develop something else, you find another provisional and try to create these kind of series of provisionals to get you protected. And once you, within that first year, you know, before the, before the year lapses, you file your final patent application. Um, and, and then you have, you know, depending on the process for us, um, it was, we had a very good patent attorney where, uh, you know, you, you need to have a strategy, an IP strategy and how you're going to the patent office because you want to increase your chances of getting, uh, getting a patent. So if you, if your claims, what you're claiming is really, really wide, there's a high chance of it being rejected and you need to go back to reiterating and narrowing down the scope of what you're trying to claim as patentable. Um, so there was, there was a lot of work on that area to, uh, and that's how we got we got the first patent, and then we you know we continued with that process, and now we have about eight or eight or nine uh, approved kind of issued patents and pending patent applications in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and China. Interesting. So that's quite fascinating. Um, it sounds kind of interesting to me that if somebody you, you mentioned that you can't you didn't put your thesis out until after you had filed the what'd you call it provisional provisional patent application Pro provisional patent application but if you had it would have been would it have basically tanked the whole thing or just been probably yeah. negative it could tank the entire thing because it's it's a public record that this tech, this information this proprietary information already exists in the public domain and anyone can access it before you came and say hey i have this idea or I have this technology that is patentable. Uh, so uh, it, it, it just seems interesting to me that because obviously how many students are probably coming up with actually relatively interesting things who may not necessarily even intend to build a business out of it, or, um, you know, may, maybe you could speak to this. Is there a, an infrastructure inside of the universities to help basically talk to the students and say, Hey, by the way, you know, like the professor might be like, this is pretty cool. Let's, you know, let's get you through this process to do, you know, file, file that provisional. Is there anything like that? In, in, I would say in most cases there is. Uh, the only different part about architectural schools and, and, and university, you know, colleges is that um, unfortunately it's less familiar for an architect to come up with an, an invention. Uh, so it's not like when you, for example, go to MIT and, uh, uh, in the engineering department or even the architectural department, um, uh, they have all that process figured out from all other specialties and, and uh, schools and disciplines. Um, so they know exactly what to do and they have uh, they have a patent office inside the school. Uh, in my case, it was it was not it was not it was not that. So uh, uh, just because, you know, architects typically. They, they are very creative. They are solving a lot of things. And a lot of times these could be uh, inventions for systems that could be uh, scalable, but uh, it's limited to one project. So it's very, very custom bespoke solution to you know a single project. Uh, so 
but I would say, yeah, a lot of a lot of schools and universities have that kind of patent office and technology transfer office where they can guide you and can help you about in, in the first steps of the process of what you need to do and mm -hmm. you can go around that. And sometimes they cover the entire cost, but they own the IP at the same time. So that's a, there's a kind of a yeah. Yeah, I heard, I heard about this recently. Somebody was speaking about, I forget which podcast I heard it on, but they're talking about this, this IP transfer and how a lot of the schools are trying to capture it, even if somebody else, you know, in their research lab came up with it, they're getting no ownership of it, right? They're not getting even, uh, in some cases, any, any ownership of that IP. I think it'll be interesting to see if there's more equitable models for that. But again, you know, it, it doesn't make sense that some of these resources wouldn't have been afforded to these people. But anyways, as, an, as a topic for another time, one yeah, thing I'm... I'm kind of curious about, so I'd like to continue down the funding path here. So once you, once you got your first customer kind of, and things started rolling, was this something that you built the model so that you could bootstrap it? Or did you then decide, okay, we're going to go raise again? Because if I'm not mistaken, this is largely a hardware technology. Yes. So it's a hardware thing in climate tech, hardware and climate tech are difficult not a lot of funding partners, especially if you look at when, when did you begin? This was 2018 or so when you were yeah. really getting going. Yeah, exactly. So I guess there was some climate tech infrastructure there, but what happened after that, after that original 250,000, you know, you've got now a new customer and I'm assuming maybe a few more walk us through the next steps in that funding process. Yeah. And, and, uh, as you said, it hardware and, and hard tech is hard, um, and uh, a lot of the investors prefer to invest in software companies and you know SaaS models and things like that, um, just because they they believe that you know with hardware you have a very capital intensive business, and you know manufacturing facilities and you need a lot of uh, uh, investment to go into equipments and and R and D and and fabrication manufacturing and all of the infrastructure that goes that. So knowing what I knew that that's going to be a very uphill, strong uphill battle to do uh, at the beginning for a first time founder, a technology that is, uh, there's a lot of things at the beginning that people didn't believe that this could work uh, because the way we're, we're, we're putting the system on is basically using adhesive materials. And if you think about it, it's just adhesive for people that are outside the, the industry, uh, that's, you know, they start to <laughs> feel or think or imagine like scotch tape and things like that. And it's like, start feeling that, oh, Windows is going to fall out and all of this uh, potential risk. So a lot of people did not believe that this could, could actually happen. Uh, so I had to adopt a capital efficient business model and say, hey, we can't, we can raise, you know, like 10 million from the get-go. Even when we had our first paying customer or early adopter, uh, and we need to, to adopt like a milestone-based funding uh strategy where you achieve you know you build you build the first prototype you raise 100k you you, you pass the testing you secure the 250 you get the first pilot you do the 500,000 get the first customer you, you go for a seed round um and, and this way you kind of de-risking the technology as you go through and you're raising the most the, the least amount of capital you need to be able to get you to the next level or to the next point so uh, in that process we didn't say that we need to build our own facility from 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 scratch and from the from the early days and hire our own uh, people in every position to execute this. Uh, we said we're going to rely on existing partners, existing infrastructure, and inf existing resources, and build something that uh, you know uh, can be really scalable fast. Where you're, you, you don't have any capital intensive components to the business. So manufacturing, fabrication, and installation for us is outsourced right now. And we're, we're acting more like a, a technology company. Um, so we're very nimble. Uh, uh, and uh, basically our burn rate is, is to the minimum and just personnel and engineers uh, that are working on this. And uh, for example, when COVID hit, we didn't, we didn't really worry about you know having a facility that is going to now be um, uh, a liability and you need to think about costs and expenses or labor or people that you need to lay off because there are no no work for example or anything like that uh, so that was very very helpful uh, to 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 use or to do basically from the beginning mm -hmm. okay yeah. so then after did you raise another round beyond that that initial 250 then 
Yeah, so we did a 500K uh, convertible note as well. And then we did a 2 million seed round. Uh, that was our first equity round. We closed it at the end of 2021. Um, and uh, that got us to where we are now, you know, kind of validating a number of other stuff. So you're always validating new things, you know, go to market strategy, mm, yeah. scalable, getting more clients and uh, testing, you know, improving the product, doing, continuing to do R&D, developing new, new solutions and new use cases. Uh, all right, now we're looking to raise uh, a new round, like a Series A, where now we're thinking about starting to vertically integrate part of the process, you know, part of the fabrication mm -hmm. process um, to, uh, you know, w which would be beneficial on a number of aspects. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Okay, interesting. Um, so one thing I'm curious about is the partnership. So you mentioned that you're essentially trying to build a platform for these other technologies. How, how do you work with that? Is that, you know, you have to come up with some very elaborate partnership agreement at the beginning. Are you going to be able to get a, a, a kind of a, a percentage of the proceeds of their sales and vice versa? Will they sell your technology in order to implement their technology? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, so that's a number of partnership types. So we have fabrication partnerships that are different than installation uh, uh, installer partnerships, different than referral partners or sales partners. Uh, and, and that's different than uh, technology, uh, glass technology uh, development partners. So uh, I'll start with the, la the last one. Basically, you, you, you get a joint development agreement in place uh, where you're saying, we're going to develop this combined system that has your glass technology with our retrofit system that could be available to the market. And basically uh, you will we'll share the, the benefits of that or the, the financial outcome or, or uh, financial profit from, from that development when we sell. So the, the technology ends up becoming owned by the two parties, the newly developed IP, uh, the foreground IP or the previous IP is owned by each company. And, and then where you're, trying to license or one you know one company is, is selling this uh, they'll both share uh basically the revenue from it or they will figure out a, a way to kind of uh, uh, have a revenue sharing uh, component to the agreement so that's the joint development agreement uh, at the same time you know you're looking at fabrication partners so fabrication partners um we had a pilot fabrication agreement where we said hey you know we're looking to uh, we don't know all the details. So for example, you're building, you're, you're going to fabricate units for us. We don't know how long the units are going to take and we're still iterating and we don't know how much uh, labor intensive that process is going to be at scale. So you start with a pilot fabrication agreement and say, hey, um, let's do a few units and based on that, estimate what that kind of look like in terms of time and efforts and, and resources and have something for the first year or, or first two years with, with uh, you know, a little bit of uh, terms uh, around, around fabrication and small quantities of, you know, of products fabricated. Uh, once you go through that and, and they now learn more about what's needed from their side to be able to produce this, uh, what's needed from our side uh, to know about, you know, costs and efficiencies and things like that. And then you can have a, a full, uh, kind of uh, fabrication partnership agreement where you have all the terms conditions around them. Same thing with the installers. Now referral partners where or you know sales partners, these will be paid in commissions, and then you'll need to say, okay, uh, you're gonna you're gonna become a representative of our company and of our technology in this region. Uh, and if what are the terms around that? You know, if if you bring this client, uh, what type of, you know percentages you're you're gonna get in return? What what are the expectations? The the length of this agreement? Uh, so that's a sales partnership agreement. So, uh, and you need to work with attorneys, of course, to have all these agreements put together, and uh, and, and uh, you make sure all the terms are covered and everything is kind of uh, uh, put together in these these documents. Mm, okay. But a lot of times. One, one important thing to, to mention, especially to founders, is that a lot of times this happened not at the beginning, like not at the first initial steps of the of the relationship. You first, you know, a lot of times what we do, you, you know, there is nothing in writing, uh, maybe sometimes an NDA only uh, uh, once you're starting to talk about the what what the potential uh, outcome could be or what's the potential collaboration could be. Uh, sometimes you go through doing prototypes and uh, really working for a kind of a 
a long period of time, sometimes a year, before having any sort of partnership agreement put together. Um, and that's fine, you know, you, you, because it's time consuming, especially if you're talking about start, two startups working together and they already have a finite amount of resources and uh, very little time on their hand. They're working on developing their product and now they're going to integrate other technology into it. So uh, having having minimal paperwork in, in at the beginning is okay. And, and then as you kind of, develop this relationship you you'll you'll feel when is when the time is ready to set, start to put together an agreement with all the terms and conditions and everything uh to it uh you can start with the term sheet first agree on things and then you sign it and then you can sign the, the fa- final agreement later down the road when when you're ready yeah because eventually you're going to have to pay lawyers to come up with a lot of that stuff and it's not 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 a cheap uh, endeavor yes. Interesting. Exactly. Okay. So maybe I know we're running out of time here, but there's one last thing I do think is important to cover, which is um, the financing of these projects. So are these, is this a peer play model where the building owner pays for this technology to be installed? Do you have a, a model where you take a baseline of what efficiencies they have? And then um, can, you know, you, you'll just take a certain percentage of their profits that they're saving. Like how, how does the financial financial model work for this? That's a great point. Um, so typically when we go to a customer, we offer them a number of financing options. So they can pay for it upfront, like in cash. Uh, they can finance it on their own. And there are a number of easy financing options available now, uh, like uh, uh, PACE or C-PACE, commercial PACE, for example, where they get a loan and the loan is tied to the asset or the property, not to the building owner per se. And you get a 20-year term with very low interest rates. And you can fund the the energy retrofits out of that, or we can we can help them. So we can finance the the technology, and they pay us over a course of five to ten years, for example. So they're not paying anything upfront, so zero upfront cost for them, and they start to uh, reap the benefits from day one, the energy savings. Uh, there's a there, there's a, a a new model that we're trying also to develop, similar to the solar model, where you're saying you know, you, you get to pay. So even in the easy financing options we're offering now, it's, it's, they're getting a loan, but we're facilitating that loan, uh, but still the owner that is actually uh, carrying the liability uh, of the loan. Uh, so there, there's another model where you're saying, we're going to put money in your pocket from day one, and uh, you're going to pay us for, for the next 20 years, for example. And, uh, We'll cover everything related to to those facades or window upgrades, and uh, it's not the building owner that is getting a loan. It's us. So we're we're getting the loan. We're we're financing this, and uh, it, it makes it much easier for customers to acquire a certain upgrade or acquire a certain technology instead of having, especially in the current environment. You know, think about high interest rates and uh, ability to secure a loan or if they if they need to secure the, leave that for something else to do for other t- t- types of upgrades or investment in the building or the asset. Uh, and uh, uh, here is a different mechanism where it's based on the energy savings purely. Mm-hmm. And you kind of look at, you, do, you build an energy model and you, you see how much they're, you know, consuming today and you're really within a very small margin of error you can estimate what are the savings and then you can tell them hey here's here's the here's the gap and we're gonna you know uh provide this technology where you kind of share some of the savings and we get some of the savings to to fund mm-hmm. this yeah right. no, that's great i mean I, that's, I think that's really fascinating it's obviously important to find the the most frictionless yeah. method of getting this this technology installed so this is really good i mean obviously there's some other things i would lo- like to have asked about but i think we're out of time here um any final thoughts for the audience uh things that you know what is your ask to the audience final thoughts on the future of this technology and the this the the, the green prop tech space in general um you know if if any founder is trying to to uh to get into the climate tech or or is in hard tech and would like to bounce some ideas or uh, uh need any help with anything i mean please feel free to reach out i mean my email is, is anas a n a s at innoviews.com and uh um uh would would be more than happy to help if if at all possible and uh uh i would encourage you know any founder especially in the, in these kind of hard tech spaces to find a, an accelerator that 
that is relevant to their industry, where uh, they can either connect with a strategic partner uh, in the space or have some um, focused experience or, 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 or model around what they're doing, because it can be really, really helpful, especially yes. for first founders. Yeah, it sounds like it. it sounds like if it wasn't for that network and ecosystem, it would have been a much, much more difficult oh, journey. Yeah. But um, our, <laughs> all right, Anas, I really appreciate you coming on. It's been great to have you and uh, looking forward to seeing what you guys continue to do. Thank you so much for your support. Appreciate it.